10.30. Okay, we're going to go through just a few more of these water um, systems. We're going to finish up the water system. Then we're going to take a short 15-minute break and come back in. Uh, a lot of you have probably already done fire tanks. You know, you cut out the top side, seal it with concrete. This particular uh, picture shows them putting a silicon bead between the concrete and the tire. Um, you put this in right, and that's almost, almost, almost never necessary. I would say that 99% of the tire tanks that I've ever been around have been problem free, never leak. Um, so, but some people do it. One of the other things we like about tire tanks in the winter time is the that black that tire is, is a thermal sink, and if the sun has been shining, uh, that soaks up heat during the day, and it's a lot harder to freeze up a tire tank than it is a steel tank or concrete, something like that. Um, for valves, again, for about the last five or six years, we've been using exclusively the uh, Apex full flow valve from True Test. This particular valve, um, the internal workings are only three quarters of an inch, but it'll put over 90% of the pipe capacity uh, through the valve. You know, a lot of your um, kind of over the side of the tank float valves, they only give you 25 to 30% of the capacity of that hose because they've got such a, a, a small diaphragm in there. On these apex valves, uh, even though, again, it's three quarter inch internal working, at 35 PSI, they'll put 58 gallons a minute out at 85 PSI, 120 gallons a minute. It's always fun in the spring when we turn our water system back on, out on the pivots, to see four or 500 gallon tanks fill simultaneously in less than 10 minutes. It takes about seven minutes. When we turn the water on, it takes about seven minutes to fill all four of those tanks. Yeah. Do you, uh, you want to take a 15-minute break sometime? Yeah, we're, I've just told them that when we finish oh, okay. this, this water section here, we're going to take a break. I'm sorry. That's fine. I like to see people who are on the ball. Usually I'm not. Uh, you know, concrete tanks are something else that can be used uh, on the, the unit that we manage, even though I talk about how great tire tanks are and all that, we don't have tire tanks because when, when we came onto this place and they decided to move ahead with putting the grazing cell in place, couldn't find the tires fast enough, but these 500 gallon uh, half septic tanks uh, were available for like 125 bucks. And so that's what we have in. The problem that we see with them is they're susceptible to cracking and recognize the reason you can get, we can get these half septic tanks that cheap is because uh, they didn't pass inspection, which meant they had hairline cracks in them. And if you let some freezing take place of that, that accelerates the cracking. Uh, you can seal them up. We use uh, plastic roof cement, you know, black roof cement to seal them. You can use silicon, hydraulic cement, different things to do it, but it becomes just one more thing that you have to do is manage the uh, cracks in them. And I've heard of, you know, some manufactured tanks brand new that have been put in and have cracks already in them. Um, these are, this is like a 200 gallon Rubbermaid tank. Uh, they're relatively low cost compared to putting in a tire tank or concrete or steel, something like that. Uh, but they're, they're definitely less durable than a, a tire tank. How they compare to concrete, I'm not sure. Have you ever tried to repair one yet? Rubbermaid tanks, again, I've done Rubbermaid tanks with the plastic roof cement, and uh, it, it'll, it works reasonably well. When we were in North Missouri, most of the portable tanks we used were Rubbermaids, and I let too many of them freeze and, you know, got cracks in them. And then, of course, there's also the time when you're chopping ice out of them and you don't have real good axe control and you put a, whole, a slice right through the side of it because you hit it with the axe. Now is that little plastic roof cement? Now is that a true rubber made or is it rubber like true tough rubber or is it the plastic fiberglass rubber the, the, made? The ones that we used were the, the, the company, the trademark rubber made yeah. tank. Because I did that, I I've, I've got 
two packs about halfway through it now. Yeah. And the, the plastic roof cement, it's, it's not a do it one time and you're fixed for life. You know, it, it becomes an ongoing patching thing and each year you're probably going to redo something. I already talked a little bit about the grain bed rings for larger herds. Um, people used to put these in pouring concrete, you know, the entire bottom of them. Well, where we live, a yard of concrete is 185 bucks. So, uh, because we're so far from anything. Uh, so you don't do that. So now typically, if you're doing something like this, they just put like an 18 inch circular form that the ring sets down into and seal it either with a plastic liner or bentonite clay. Out west, fortunately, a lot of places are naturally bentonite and just tamp it down in there and it'll do it. In North Missouri, on some of the clay soils we had, I'm just pretty darn sure that we could have done the same thing up there and sealed them up fine. Uh, let's actually go ahead, I forgot this one was in here, let's go ahead and take our break now. And what time, my official time keeper, what time is it? Now, 35. 25 till, let's try to be in here in our seats no later than 5 to 11. <laughs> All right, we're going to get back underway. With winter coming, I think we've got to talk about uh, about winter stock water a little bit. Now, this might come as a shock to a lot of you. After having spent 23 years in Missouri and then moving to Idaho, this, this is Idaho, and you might think it looks a little snowy and cold. In our experience so far, Idaho winters are much nicer than Missouri winters. And it all has to do with humidity. Um, we do get a little colder where we are now. The snow cover stays a little longer. But in terms of just the amount of snow that we get down the valley floor, remember we, we, we live in a, hot, a desert. We're at 6,000 foot elevation but we only get six to eight inches of precipitation in a year, so we can't get you know, like 10 foot of snow or anything, it just doesn't work out. Um, the biggest single snow event we've had at the level where we live has only been about 10 inches or so. Um, usually we have snow cover through the winter, but it'll only be you know from three or four to seven inches, something like that. It might be snow cover for three to four months. Uh, we have until this past spring, we haven't had any mud. You know, that's one nice thing about not being in North Missouri anymore, is not contending with mud. Uh, if we did have mud this spring, it's because we're still getting snow into June. So, uh, and that does make for a little mud. So when we, when we think about uh, winter stock water, a few things change, and particularly if we're dealing with dry pregnant cows, we don't have the lactation demand for water. We don't have the temperature demand for water. Now, if you've got fall calving cattle or you've got you know, fall lamb and ewes, the water demand is going to be higher. But with dry pregnant cows, only 8 to 10 gallons a day is what they're going to drink in the wintertime. So we don't need to be able to supply as much water. Uh, now, stock, if you have wean calves or stockers, they need more water per unit of body weight than do cows. Particularly comparing stockers that you're trying to put weight on to just a dry, pregnant cow. Uh, stockers are going to use quite a bit more water. We have the dry, pregnant ewe for those four or five days without any water. Uh, and then here's another factor that comes into play. In the summertime, we try to keep them within, to keep the cattle within six to 600 to 1,000 feet of water. In the wintertime, I have no problem making a cow walk a mile of water. You know, half a mile to a mile doesn't bother me. Why? Because she's only going once a day, maybe not even once a day. She's not at a production level where walking that extra distance is going to be a stress for her. Does anybody have any idea what that is? What's going on here? Okay, so we'll, we'll keep them closer to water if need be. We'll let them go farther to water if need be. Now, 
To me, scrubs and paint in the winter are no big deal. You know, I'll go out and rain dice as long as it's not a road made paint that I'm sticking the axe through the side of. Uh, I don't mind breaking ice. What becomes a real problem is when water lines, very water lines freeze. Then you have a problem. And so when we're designing the system, uh, we want to prevent risk of water lines freezing below the ground. If you have over the surface lines, we're not overly concerned about them freezing. Because most days, particularly if we're looking at southern Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, most days in the winter, it is going to get above freezing. If the sun shines, black polyethylene pipe on the surface absorbs heat, it can thaw out fairly quickly. Uh, but buried lines frozen are a pain. So we talk about you know, putting it below the frost line, which here, if you put water below two feet, you're probably good. Where we live, the frost line is six to eight feet. So when people put in water lines at the traditional depth, it's at a minimum of six feet deep. Well, again, you take a backhoe or a track hoe out and start going six feet to put lines in, it becomes very uh, expensive. This is the way most stock water lines in our part of the world get put in. If, uh, and we have a lot of rock, but it's all loose river rock kind of stuff, uh, not you know, outcrops, bedrock, like a lot of the Ozarks have. It's a little hard to pull a shank ripper like this through bedrock. You can do it through uh, loose rock. You go up to a place like North Missouri, Central Missouri, deep soils, very, very little rock, and you can just fly with a layer like this. Spool of pipe is being supported on the, uh, uh, with front end loader here, going through a chute. Now we're only putting that pipe in at about 30 inches. So we're not putting it below frost line. The way we, we are preventing it from freezing is maintaining continuous water flow. Freezing, flowing water won't freeze, so we just maintain continuous flow. If you've got a three gallon a minute well, you can't do this. If you have ponds that are dry at the end of the summer, you can't do this. Where a system like this works well is if you have springs. If you can do a spring development and maintain continuous maintain continuous flow of water, uh, that is the best way of keeping your tanks and the water lines all open in the winter. Is a spring-fed system, and that's what we operate there in Idaho. Uh, in the summertime, we pull our water right off the irrigation main lines, but in the winter, we run off of the spring system. And I know through through the Ozarks even going into eastern Oklahoma, there are quite a few springs, good capacity, that you can do water developments like this. <coughs> yeah. We hit minus 20, minus 25 every winter, just, you know, typically for a few days, not for extended periods. Um, we have clients in much colder places who, th this is one of that big uh, grain bin ring or tank that we had seen earlier, and this is in western Montana, and they keep that, uh, their the, the tanks that large open with continuous flow of water because they have the spring water availability to do it. We're not looking at keeping open 30 foot diameter tanks. You know, four foot, six foot tanks, things like that. It really doesn't take a lot of water uh, to keep them open. This is, uh, we use what we call overflow system. This is not an overflow system. This is just a tank that's running over. And, uh, but for, for this guy, it is actually uh, uh, it is actually his overflow system. It's just a continuous spring flow coming in here. The tank runs over. It doesn't freeze. But of course, you've got a big ice sheet going downhill and all those things. We want to avoid having messes like this. Uh, how many of you know who Zach Jones is in Montana? Uh, just one. He's a hurt quitter. He's a holistic uh, management instructor. Uh, this is his first cousin, Bob. <clears throat> in a planned overflow system, what we have is we actually have a, an intake in the tank. And in, in this system here, the, the riser pipe for the uh, inflow, and because they, they run up to about 700 cows in this bunch, they actually have a T 
with two of these apex valves in rather than just a single apex valve. But also on the inside here, there's a riser pipe, an uh, inch and a half diameter.